one God who creates us, redeems us, and calls us by name. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and your beloved children. We have turned our faces away from your glory when it did not appear as we expected. We have rejected your word when it made us confront ourselves. We have failed to show hospitality to those you called us to welcome and accept our repentance for the things we have done. And the things we have left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us and lead us, that we may bathe in the glory of your Son, born among us, and reflect your love for all creation. Amen. <coughs> Rejoice in this good news. In Christ Jesus, your sins are fully forgiven. You are descendants of the Most High. You are adopted into the household of Christ and inheritors of eternal life. Live as free and forgiven children of God. Amen. <laughs> Most holy God, the earth is filled with your glory. And before you, angels and saints stand in awe. Enlarge our vision to see your power at work in the world. And by your grace, Make us heralds of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first lesson this morning is found um, in Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook in the voices of those who called, and the house is filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now this, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep listening, but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. Make the mind of this people dull, and stop their ears, and shut their eyes, so that they may not look with their eyes, and listen with their ears, and comprehend with their minds. And turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant, and houses without people, and the land is utterly desolate, until the Lord sends everyone far away, and vast is the emptiness in the midst of the land. Even if a tenth part remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth, or an oak whose stump remains standing when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. The word of God. Sorry, yes, the word of God, the word of life. Thanks be to God. Let's responsibly read Psalm 138. I will give thanks to you, Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and praise your name because of your steadfast love and faithfulness. For you have glorified your name and your word above all. When I called, you answered me. You increased my strength within me. Of all the rulers of the earth will praise you, O Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth. 
They will sing of the ways of the Lord, that great is the glory of the Lord. The Lord is high, and it cares for the lowly, perceiving the haughty from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you keep me safe. You stretch forth your hand against the furry of my enemies. Your right hand shall save me. You will make good your purpose for me. O Lord, your steadfast love endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hand. Our second lesson is taken from 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you, as of first importance, what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Gail. This time I'll ask any girls or boys that are in church this morning to come on up for our children's message. Collect our penny offerings as you do. So come on, kiddos. Now, the reason I'm talking about this 
water. And when people heard about this, they thought, wow, that's amazing. But they didn't know if they could believe it or not. But the most amazing thing that Jesus did, and Jesus did a lot of amazing things. The most amazing thing of all, though, was that he rose again from the dead. Which means he died, and he died on the cross. And three days later, on Easter, on Easter Sunday, he was alive again. And a lot of his disciples and a lot of his friends went around telling people, you remember Jesus? You remember Jesus of Nazareth? He was dead, but now he's alive again. Do you think everybody believed him at first? No, they didn't. They told those disciples, you know what? I'm not so sure about that. I don't know if I can believe that. But in our second lesson today, we read about this one time that Jesus, after he was dead, after he rose again, showed himself not to one person, not to two people, nor not to 12 disciples, but to 500 people all at once. I'd be like if Jesus came and our church is filled, 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 and all of a sudden he came and he showed himself and he proved that he really was alive. Now what do you think those people did after they saw Jesus? Did they believe then? You better believe they believed then. And Jesus would continue to do this for 40 days. He'd continue to show himself to people and make believers and make the point today is, you know, what Jesus tells us and the things that he does, they're real and they're true. And what do we do? We follow him, don't we? We love him and we tell other people about Jesus as well. All right, kiddos, let's fold our hands. Close your eyes. Repeat after me and pray really loud today, okay? Everybody say, Dear God. Dear God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. For this beautiful day. For your resurrection. For all of your miracles. And please help our world. Believe in you. Follow you. And trust you. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners on the other boat to come and help them. But they came and filled both boats, so they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. <coughs> Praise to you, O Christ. Please remain standing as we sing our contemporary praise. Here I am to worship.
I like to start my message off with something a little bit lighthearted. And I heard about this elderly couple that were celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary. They're sitting on a swing, swing in the summertime, holding hands, and the husband, feeling really romantic, said to his wife, our love is tried and true. But she had a hard time hearing and asked him to repeat himself, so he said it again. Our love is tried and true. He was getting a little bit upset, said, Hot, huh? could you speak up? I can't hear you. He was getting really upset by this point, so he hollered, Our love is tried and true. She said, Well, fine. I'm sick of you, too. <laughs> We have eight days until Valentine's Day, people. All right, so this is your warning. If you don't have a gift for your sweethearts, we are officially into that crunch time. But grace and peace to you from God the Father, and from our Lord, and from our Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Sixty years, that's a long time to celebrate two people together. Uh, my wife, Corey, and I will be celebrating our 15-year anniversary this upcoming summer, and it's kind of amazing how quickly life goes by. And if you've been married for even a year or two years, 40 years, 50 years, uh, you can look back and life goes really, really quickly. But love and marriage is something that, that takes attention and takes effort from both a husband and and a wife, but it changes, doesn't it? From the very first moment that you, the two people meet until you've been married for years and years, love changes and it evolves. I remember when Corey and I were first dating, you know, we want to spend every moment together, but you're also learning about each other. You're learning about where you grew up, you're learning about your different friends. We met in college. Corey's from Gretna, I'm from Beatrice. And I remember telling her about this one haunted location in Gage County. Now all small towns and all places have these different places. And in Gage County, there's a really small cemetery that is located way out in the country. You got to take gravel roads, dirt roads, far, far away from Beatrice and far, far away from any small town. And this cemetery is called Stark Cemetery. And here's a picture of it. This is a daytime picture of it. However, kids that grew up in Beatrice always knew that this was a cemetery. You did not want to drive by in the middle of the night. Because rumor, gossip has it that Stark Cemetery, it's haunted. And there's this creepy bridge that you drive across on the way to Stark Cemetery. And rumor goes, that this bridge is haunted by children. And you have to put, go back to, I'm dating Corey, and I, I'm really amping this story up, right? <laughs> I'm trying to make you know, my upbringing sound exciting and thrilling. I'm telling her all these different stories, some true and some I was definitely embellishing a little bit, but we're driving out, pitch black in the middle of the night, and I'm telling her all this stuff. And we've seen this bridge in front of us, and I say, okay, when we drive across it, look out your window, because people will say every once in a while you can see these ghosts of these children. And I slow down, and I'm getting ready to cross this bridge, and I'm going maybe three miles per hour. We pull up on the bridge, kill the car. <laughs> she was freaking out, but so was I. Growing up in the 90s, but 
but I remember a few episodes in particular just really kind of spooked you. As Mulder and Scully, they're these FBI agents, and what they do is they investigate the paranormal, the things that cannot be explained. Now you think here in Nebraska, we don't have stuff like that, do we? You know, we don't have Area 51 close to us. We don't have the Loch Ness Monster close to us. We certainly don't have sightings of Bigfoot, right? Well, believe it or not, we do. In fact, I came across this preparing for the sermon. There was kind of a, a big local to-do where a 15-year-old boy had a Bigfoot sighting. Small town called Linwood. May ring a bell. Linwood is located about 30 miles west of Fremont. And this happened in 2014. There's a big article that the uh, Lincoln Journal starts. You can still Google and read about. But here's how it goes. The story starts one early morning last summer 2014. It was less than an hour before sunrise along a dark gravel road not far from the Platte River. A 15-year-old boy was at the wheel, and he was on his way to driver's ed class with his dad beside him. But dad had no, nodded off or had his eyes on his phone, depending on who tells the story. The boy would later report that he saw a big, hairy creature, maybe seven feet tall, on two legs ran in front of the vehicle, then just as quickly disappeared into the trees by Skull Creek. Bigfoot. We've got Bigfoot here in our midst. Can you believe it? He's not hiding in the trees. Maybe he's hiding in the cornfields, but we've got Bigfoot. Now certainly, they would have called the authorities, right? Maybe they could have called Mulder and Skull, or at least called the sheriff's office. Well, believe it or not, it got out, word got out, and it became the gossip of the town and the community. Saunders County Sheriff Kevin Stockholz says, it certainly generated a lot of coffee shop conversation. I believe that. But, he says, we're pretty much moving on what he says from this report. Now, the reason I bring this up is when Jesus lived, he did all the miracles that he did. If you saw it, you were a believer. How could you not see Jesus feed 5,000 people and not believe? If you saw him walk on water, how could you see that and not believe? If you saw him bring back to life Lazarus, who was dead for four days, if you'd seen that with your own eyes, how could you not believe? But there were thousands and thousands and thousands of people who did not see Jesus with their own eyes. As they heard other people in their community start to talk about who this Jesus was and what he was about, and he was sent by God, and they heard this, and they heard all these stories of his miracles, you'd better believe there are some skeptics. I think there's two types of people. There's people that are very intrigued when they hear about things that, like what Jesus did, and then there's people that are naturally very skeptical. If they don't see it, if they don't experience it themselves, they're not going to believe it. There's a lot of people that are this way. That, that's hard to believe. And Jesus, his life and who he was, we don't often think about this, but this is, this is hard to believe. Am I right? Jesus died on Good Friday, and he rose again. Now this is, this is greater than seeing Bigfoot. This is greater than seeing a UFO. This is a man who died and rose again. The disciples go out and they share this message, and as they do it, I'm sure they came across people who were receptive to it, but also people who were naturally skeptical to it. I think of Thomas. You think of Thomas. Thomas was with Jesus. He was one of those 12 disciples, and he saw Jesus do all those miracles that he did, and yet he had a hard time believing that Jesus rose from the dead. Thomas famously says, unless I can see with my own eyes and touch with my own hands, 
I will not believe. However, our second lesson, second lesson for today, has just a, a small nugget in it. It's just three verses in all of Scripture that, once again, I think sometimes if you read Scripture too quickly, you don't slow down and fully take what God's Word is trying to tell us, I think we can miss it. So if you would, please open your bulletin along with me to page 5 this morning. In 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 4. And again, there, there's a lot of people that did not get to see Jesus, that did not see with their own eyes. How are they going to come to faith? How is God going to lead them to faith in Jesus Christ? Beginning in verse 4, we read that Jesus was buried, but he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. He appeared to Cephas, which is another name for Simon Peter, and then to the twelve, the twelve disciples. After that, Jesus appeared to more than how many? Five hundred of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. So what God's Word is trying to tell us is Jesus is very, very active. Jesus would, would appear and show himself to many people for those 40 days. And God's Word is trying to tell us, you know what? Jesus didn't just appear to one person at a time. Because our natural skepticism, we can be skeptical of that. You know, you're, you have a friend or someone tells you that they saw something. That they saw something they couldn't explain. And sometimes we're, we're naturally skeptical of that. But here, God's Word is telling us he appeared to 500 people. People at once. You don't believe it? You don't believe that Jesus is really alive? Go speak to them. Go talk to them. You doubt it? Approach them. Have a conversation with them. 500 people all at one time, and they're still alive. They're still living. How did so many people come to faith? I'm confident that the Holy Spirit was active, but Jesus continued to show himself to people, to followers, and the faith really exploded. How does the faith go from 12 people, 12 disciples, to 2 billion people today? It's a living God. It's, it's a living and breathing and resurrected Jesus Christ. I'll end with this. If you have some skepticism, if you have some doubts, you're not alone. I think this is very common. Even for those born and raised in the faith, you know, it, it's, it's sometimes you wonder, is this real? How can I be sure that Jesus is real? He, he died and he rose again, and because of that, he offers me eternal life. And Mark 9, we read about a man who has a very sick son. And he encounters Jesus, and he's heard about Jesus, and Jesus is able to, to do miracles, and he's able to heal. And he goes to Jesus, and he begs Jesus to heal his son. And Jesus says to this man in Mark 9, If you believe, your son will be made well. And this man says the words I think so many of us Christians can repeat. No. I believe, yeah. but help my unbelief. Can you relate to that? I believe, but help my unbelief. I believe, but there's still some, some wondering inside of me. I believe, Lord, but help my unbelief. And God does that. God will give you that assurance. God will give you that faith. God will grow that faith. And what I find most assuring about this occasion in Mark 9 is that this man, even though he believes, but he, he realizes there's a sense of doubt, even in that moment, Jesus heals. Jesus healed the son and made him whole, made him complete. Jesus is Lord. He's Lord of this life. He's Lord of the afterlife. He came to give you freedom, to give you forgiveness, to give you life eternal. Would you believe? And when you doubt, when you have skepticism, say, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Amen? Amen. Our service continues this morning. 
Where's our offering for your prayer? I thank you for your offering and your gifts. To us. Uh, the basket is located in the back. Um, they allow us to do ministry here at Redeemer. So thank you, thank you for your offerings this morning. But let us pray. Gracious God, your word made flesh brings harmony to the earth. As we offer ourselves and these your gifts, prepare us to receive the grace and truth and renew in us the song of your salvation. And Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We do it to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times, and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, you have shone forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved Son. And in the miracle of water turned into wine, he revealed your glory. Just a quick note about communion here at Redeemer. We continue to have communion packets. They are located on the back table. If you'd prefer to take communion in your pew this morning, um, please feel free to grab a packet. Um, you're, we don't have to come forward. There are a number of different ways we can take communion here at Redeemer. For the night in which our Lord and Savior Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. He gave thanks and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. This is the body of Christ given for you. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come, our Lord's table is prepared.
Send us to bring good news and to proclaim your favor to all. Strengthen with the richness of your grace. And your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us sing our sending hymn.